He was fascinated by King Solomon's temple that once stood above the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem. Newton saw the design of the temple encoded in the Bible and he spent years attempting to break this code. For Newton, the scenes of the Book of Revelation take place in the Heavenly Temple. And so in order to understand the Book of Revelation, in order to interpret the symbols, he needed to uh, understand what the temple looked like. The temple could even reveal the date when this corrupt world would end in the apocalypse and true Christianity would be reborn. It was, for him, the object of some of his prophetic hopes because he believed the temple was going to be rebuilt, re-established in Jerusalem when Christ returns. So this was a part of his prophetic hope. He believed this was going to happen. Newton thought the temple would also increase his scientific knowledge. He believed that the Temple of Solomon was a literal blueprint for the secrets of the universe. Its orientation, its size, he redrew it, he did fundamental math mathematical calculations on it to understand and plumb the universe at large, and in essence, the mind of God. In England, near Salisbury, there's a piece of antiquity called Stonehenge, which seems to be an ancient temple, for it is an area compassed circularly with two rows of very great stones, with passages on all sides for people to go in and out. Newton only visited Stonehenge in his imagination, but he was sure it also revealed the wisdom of the ancients. He told this story that in ancient times, people knew that the sun was in the middle of the world, the planets orbit the sun, there was a force of gravity between the planets and the sun, and Newton said the ancients knew that. Okay, now how did he know that the ancients knew these things? Well, one sign was that the ancients built buildings which symbolized the solar system that the ancient temples had fires in the middle, which stood for the sun. So he understood Stonehenge as an image of the solar system, with its central fire and then the sarsen stones as a series of concentric rings standing for the orbits of the planets. He could imagine priests walking around Stonehenge chanting various songs. Um, carrying on the Vestal religion, which was the religion that presumably God gave to Adam. Newton is reading in his views into Stonehenge, you know, that, that there is no remnants of a fire at the middle of Stonehenge. I think Newton treats the evidence of Stonehenge in the same way that he treats most other pieces of evidence. Uh, he has a hunch and he ruthlessly crunches evidence to make it fit his own case. What, whether it's science, or looking at the ancient religion. He's like a brilliant lawyer. In 1684, Edmund Halley, a young astronomer, asked Newton a question that would refocus his scientific genius on gravity, the mysterious force that binds the universe together. A truly remarkable invention. Mm. Thank you. Mirror requires work. My question is this. What kind of curve would be described by the planets, supposing the force of the attraction toward the sun to be reciprocal to the square of the distance from it? An ellipse. An ellipse? How do you know? I've done the calculation. You have? How did you calculate it? I'll show you. There should be here somewhere. <clears throat> Halley's question would change science forever. It caused Newton three years' frenzied work. Mm. 
Uh, don't worry, I will redo the calculations. I'll send you a copy. Some months later, Halley received a short tract on the motion of planets in orbit. In his hand, Halley had the seeds of Newton's The Principia Mathematica, published in 1687. It is the greatest book of science ever written, bar none. It is the most magnificent work. It is the most all-encompassing work. It is the most daring book of any scientific treatise ever written. In the Principia, Newton spelt out the laws of motion, but his greatest achievement was the universal law of gravity. This is saying that something on one end of the universe, billions of miles away, actually exerts an attraction through all the intervening material on one tiny particle on the other side of the universe. And that, that is an extraordinary thought. And in my view, and the view of everybody else who's looked at it, uh, there is simply nothing like that in physics up to that point. Nothing at all. But deep within the pages of the Principia, especially in the later editions, researchers have discovered clues that show the hidden Newton, the passionate alchemist. Professor Newman has found evidence that Newton gave an alchemical explanation for gravity when describing the role of comets. As far as the natural world went, he did have a unified vision. And even in the Principia, we find the Sal Nitrum, the niter theory, where he says that the tails of comets sink down to the Earth and then are somehow buoyed back up into the outer reaches of space and eventually serve as the food of the sun that allows it to continue to burn. So he was thinking in terms of this circulation theory even at the time of composing and revising the Principia. Newton also believed comets were instruments of God's wrath devastating weapons that would wipe out the corrupt world and bring the apocalypse as foretold in the Bible. He searched the Bible for the dates when the earth would end in a fiery maelstrom and for Christ's return to usher in a thousand years of pure Christianity. The 1687 edition of the Principia only contains one reference to God as creator. But in later editions, Newton stressed the all-powerful role of God in his universe. The most beautiful system of the sun, planets and comets could only proceed from the counsel and dominion of an intelligent and powerful being. God therefore place the planets at different distances from the sun so that according to their degrees of density they may enjoy a greater or lesser proportion of the sun's heat. When Newton was at the height of his fame he was driven by his hatred of Catholics to oppose the Catholic King James II. He came up against notorious Judge Jeffreys, the Lord Chancellor, known as the Hanging Judge for his brutality. Newton rose up against the King because a Catholic was handed a degree at the university, at a time when all Catholics were barred. A mixture of Papists and Protestants in the same university can neither subsist happily nor long together. It was a risky strategy. And if the fountains once be dried up... That if one appeared in front of the law,